All right, uh, we're going to start at verse 3 uh, because, yes, last week uh, we spent all of that time on just two verses. Uh, didn't get too far last week, but it was really fun to, to talk about art and to see everyone's, um, you know, some of you know, your favorite pieces. Uh, but we're going to start here at the third verse. Uh, and indeed, Paul is speaking very personally uh, to the Galatians. Uh, and he says, uh, verse 3, Are you so foolish? Having started with the Spirit, are you now ending with the flesh? Uh, and uh, again, we've, we've noticed this. Paul can speak with these uh, rather col colorful words uh, in harsh tones with the Galatians, even though he does love these people. Uh, and, I, and I've said uh, along the way that Paul does um, speak in, in somewhat different ways to the Galatians, the, the congregation that he loves, uh, compared to the, the opponents of his who have been deceiving the Galatians. And so even though these are harsh words, uh, we're still going to note um, the, the love uh, that's in his words here. Uh, but but he's saying, he's saying they are being fools. Um, uh, he, started the, he started the chapter in the same way, you foolish Galatians. Uh, so now uh, verse 3, are you so foolish? And, and now here's, here's, what, here's what is so foolish. Here's the, 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 the foolishness uh, that they're part of. He says, having started with the Spirit, are you now ending with the flesh? And, and of course, this is Spirit with a capital S. Uh, this, is, this is God's Spirit. Uh, this is not just sort of a kind of a metaphorical term for spiritual matters. I mean, he, Paul is talking about the Spirit. Um, and, and like we just heard uh, in, in church on Sunday with the, the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost, uh, the Holy Spirit is God himself. Uh, and, and this will come up again on Sunday when we uh, observe Trinity Sunday. Uh, that the Holy Spirit is not just sort of a little part of God or kind of an aspect of God. The Spirit is God. It, the Holy Spirit, he is a person uh, of the Trinity. Uh, and, and, and these Galatians, Paul says, they, they started uh, with the Spirit. That is, it was the Holy Spirit who came to them and gave them the righteousness of Christ. It was the Holy Spirit who came to them uh, and, and brought them uh, the, the words of Christ uh, through the preaching of Paul it was the Holy Spirit who came and gave them uh, the gift of faith. Uh, the Holy Spirit did all of this for them. Uh, and, and really, you know, Paul says they've begun with the Spirit, they've started with the Spirit, uh, and now they're ending with something else. And this is, the, not the way, this is not the way that faith is supposed to go. Please observe this, uh, that Paul uh, would like them <laughs> to begin with the Spirit and end with the Spirit. Okay, the Spirit is not given to us only to get us going. It's not that the Holy Spirit just gives us a little boost at the beginning and then asks us to take over from there. No, no, no. Uh, what Paul is saying is this is the foolishness to think that you could begin with the Holy Spirit but then sort of take back the reins and say, okay, Holy Spirit, thanks for getting me started, but now I've got it from here. Okay, that is foolishness. Uh, the, the Holy Spirit, uh, he begins the work, he continues the work, he completes the work, okay? Uh, God is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. Uh, salvation is not uh, our job to begin or continue or finish. Uh, it is God's work through and through, all right? And to think anything else, Paul says, is foolishness. Uh, it is being a fool uh, to think that the Spirit was simply the beginning and now you've got to take over and finish the job. No, Paul says that is, that is foolishness. Uh, and so Paul says, now there, there's a dichotomy here. Uh, Paul is, is creating a, a sort of showing there, there's uh, two things uh, sort of at war with one another, uh, two opposites. Uh, there is the Spirit and there is the flesh. Again, and, and, and that is the Holy Spirit and there is our flesh. Uh, and, and here when Paul is saying the flesh, he's, uh, uh, he is not only talking about the physical stuff that we can see, that is your, your skin and bones. Uh, this is everything that is not the Holy Spirit. That is all of our old existence. Uh, and, and so this, this even includes, um, uh, you know, this includes our, our minds, our hearts, our intentions, our thoughts. And, and Paul is saying all of that is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who makes us righteous. There's nothing inside of us that can do that. 
There's no power that we have, whether it's a physical power or a mental power. None of that can make us holy. The Holy Spirit makes us holy. Uh, and, and, I, and I say all of that because sometimes as Christians we can get confused about this and we think that, okay, the flesh, that's just the physical part of us. That's the bad part, the physical stuff. But, you know, it's the mental stuff or it's the, you know, it's kind of our emotions or our feelings. That's the good part. And we, and we sort of, we make the, we make the dichotomy uh, inside of ourselves. Uh, we say again, the flesh is all the stuff down here, the, the, the physical stuff, the stuff we can see, whereas there's sort of this other part of us that's really good, okay? And we, and, and we try to make uh, the, the, the divide, the division inside of ourselves. But that's not where Paul is making the division, okay? Paul is making the division outside of ourselves and saying there's the Holy Spirit over here who has made us holy, and then there's all of this, us, which does not make us holy. Okay, again, we, we as sinners, we want to make the division inside of ourselves and say, no, there's some really good part of me that, that, that can sort of take the reins. There's some really good part of me that can finish the job. Again, maybe it's my mind, my feelings, my intentions, and Paul says, nope, that's not where the division is. Paul is dividing it between God, the Holy Spirit, and me, the flesh. And this is very similar to how Jesus talks uh, in the third chapter of John. And this is also really good because this is, this is our gospel reading for this coming Sunday, for Trinity Sunday. We have the third chapter of John where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. Um, may as well open this up uh, if you want. You can follow along here in, in John's gospel. Um, again, uh, this will be our, our, our gospel reading for this coming Sunday for Trinity, uh, for Trinity Sunday. Uh, but in the third chapter of John, uh, this is Jesus talking with Nicodemus at night. And I'm going to look at the fifth verse here in, in John 3, uh, where Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. Again, capital S, Holy Spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Uh, so Jesus is, is saying that um, he's talking about this new birth that comes through water and the Spirit. He's talking about baptism. Uh, and that, uh, it, that, that, uh, that, that is a new birth that has to come from God. Uh, he's saying that God has to make that new birth happen. We cannot make that happen. He's calling us flesh there, using that same term. That, uh, and again, this is, this is, this is the, the complete human being, flesh. Uh, again, it's not, not only the stuff you can see or touch, but it's, again, it's your thoughts, your intentions, your mind, your, your intelligence, all of it is flesh. And, and the human being cannot make new birth. I cannot, no matter how hard I try physically, no matter how hard I try mentally, no matter how much I try to sort of heal myself emotionally or, or psychologically, I cannot do this. All of that is flesh. And what is needed is a new birth through the Holy Spirit. And then here's the really crazy part about it, but wonderful part, is that God now puts his Holy Spirit in the water of baptism so that this new birth from the Holy Spirit actually uh, does come to us in a very down-to-earth sort of way, uh, comes to us in the water of baptism to give us this new birth. But again, this is not from us. This is from God. Uh, even though God is using the physical things of water, or in the other sacrament, we can talk about bread and wine. Uh, even though God is using physical stuff to accomplish this, it's his spirit doing this. It's, again, it's not from us. It's not my mind, not my ideas, not my intentions. Uh, uh, all of that is flesh. And so back to Galatians now in the third chapter. Again, Paul is saying it's foolishness to think that the spirit got this started. But now you're going to kind of take over and finish the job for him. No, we can't do that. We are flesh. This new birth has to be God's project from beginning to end. I mean, it would be sort of like if, you know, uh, the, this deck project at the Parsonage. I mean, can you imagine if, uh, you know, Jerry Smith got this started and then I said, Jerry, you did a great job. I think I'll take over from there. I mean, can you imagine how horrible that deck would look right now? I mean, you know, thank God we had people like Jerry Smith and Jerry Pato and Rob and Randy Hoyer, people who really know what they're doing. I mean, if I had kicked them all out and said, guys, you've, done a, you've really started this thing nicely, but I, I'm going to take over. I will tell you, St. John's, every member of our 
congregation would think, what a waste of our money. <laughs> we let Pastor Coke take over. No way. Now, now, of course, I was out there maybe slinging a hammer a little bit, but it was because those guys were there that it is a beautiful deck right now. And, I, and you know, soon we need to have people over to come see that. Um, but again, the, these projects need God's, I mean, the, the project of our salvation needs God's hands. Uh, he is the craftsman. He is the foreman of this operation from beginning to end. Um, it is not our project to take over. Uh, so Paul says, this is foolishness. You started with the Spirit. Now you're ending with the flesh. And why, and why is that? Specifically, what was going on in Galatia? Again, uh, for them, it was these false preachers who had come in. Uh, Paul had told them about the, the justification that we receive by faith in Christ. Uh, and, and then these uh, false preachers came in. Remember, they said, well, that, that's a good start. Uh, but if you really want to be saved, if you want it to count, you're going to have to keep the law of Moses. Uh, you know, faith is a good beginning. Uh, but we've really got to, you know, faith again. Faith is just an empty cup. Now we've got to fill it up with, with good works. Uh, obedience to Moses. And specifically, they were, they were trying to convince them all they had to get circumcised. That's the real mark of a believer, you know. Uh, because a Abraham was circumcised, Moses was circumcised, all these people, the, the, all of God's people up until this time have been circumcised. You know, how dare you think that you could somehow be God's, one of God's people and not get circumcised? It's just what God's people do. And Paul is saying, no, uh, that was not what made us holy back then. It's not what makes us holy now. It is faith, uh, this work of the Holy Spirit uh, in us. Um, and, and, it's, and, and that work comes through the hearing of the word. And so Paul's going to talk about that in here in just a moment. Um, and so uh, Paul is, is saying, uh, uh, you know, again, we're, we're, we're going to let God see this project through the whole way. Uh, now, interesting, uh, interestingly, I'll just say, I know a lot of you, uh, you know, do enjoy some of these, these details, um, sort of the grammar of these passages. Uh, when, when Paul says there, uh, you know, are you now ending with the flesh? Or um, in the King James, are you now made perfect by the flesh? It, it is interestingly, that is actually a passive verb. Uh, so you really could translate that. Are you now being ended uh, with the flesh? Uh, you know, the King James actually picks up on that passive voice there. Are you now being made perfect uh, by the flesh? Um, but it, it's kind of funny, and I, I think it's funny that it is a passive voice. I mean, because one of the ways you could even really translate this is, to Paul, is that Paul is saying, are you now, yeah, being ended? Are you being finished off? Uh, in other words, being destroyed uh, by the flesh. Uh, is that this, this is what the flesh will do. If you try to use your flesh, you know, your powers, your abilities, your works, your reason, your mind, your intentions, your feelings, if you try to use any of that to complete the job of salvation, you will be ended. Uh, you will be finished off because it's not going to work. Uh, you will uh, be taking the reins from, uh, from the, the, the one who really knows what he's doing, uh, and it will end in a crash. Um, and so Paul, Paul, there's a warning here in what Paul is saying, Galatians, you know, uh, careful here. You don't want to take over from God in these matters. Uh, only God can do this. And if you think you're going to take the reins, it's going to, this, this, this whole carriage is headed for a cliff. Um, it's going to, you, you will be ended. And so then verse 4, uh, Paul says, uh, Did you, now I'm reading from the NRSV here, okay? Uh, verse 4. Did you experience so much for nothing, if it really was for nothing? Uh, now, I, I'm going to read, that was the NRSV, but I'll read from the King James, where it says, Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? Um, now, I, I, I love looking at these different translations, um, and I want to, to, to say again that there's no wrong translation, okay? I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to pick on one translation or another, but I do think, you know, all the translations have their strong points, uh, and I think there are places in each translation uh, where it'll sort of, it'll, it'll sort of bring out uh, the real meaning of the text better uh, in various points. So there's no bad translation. But I do think in this case, uh, the King James does actually pick up on something, uh, which is very helpful. Uh, that is, in the NRSV, it says, did you experience so much for nothing? Uh, the, the word really is, did you suffer so much? 
Uh, if you've got the NRSV or another Bible that uses something like, did you experience, you could write the word suffer. Did you suffer? This is truly uh, what Paul is saying. Did you suffer so much for nothing, uh, if it really was for nothing? Uh, no, that word, uh, suffer, uh, this is one that comes up a lot in the New Testament. Uh, in fact, it's the word that gives us in English the word passion. Okay, uh, so, it, you know, when we, um, or pathos, I mean, that's kind of a fancy technical word, but pathos, when you sort of have a, a suffering, uh, an experience of suffering. Uh, but this is the word that gives us passion. Uh, and this is why we talk about the passion of Christ. You know, that uh, every year uh, on uh, Palm Sunday or Good Friday, we read the passion of of Christ. Now, in English, we often associate that word with love, you know, when you, when you have a passionate love for somebody. Um, uh, but, but there, it's, it's that word at its root means to suffer. Uh, and so we talk about the passion of Christ, which is the suffering of Christ. Uh, and so, you know, just as an example, you can write this down in the notes in your margins if you want to. This word also gets used, for example, in, um, in Matthew uh, 16, 21. Uh, this is just one example. Again, this word is all over the New Testament, but this is, uh, uh, you know, one, I think, very helpful example of this Matthew 16, 21. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to turn to that if you don't want to, but uh, this, is what, this is Matthew uh, 16, 21. Uh, from that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. All right, now that, that, that should sound familiar. I mean, Jesus says that actually many times in the Gospels. These are called the passion predictions, okay? These are the, these are the many times this happens in the Gospels. Jesus tells his disciples about his passion, his suffering uh, that's going to happen. Okay, so there's that word, all right? Jesus is talking about his own suffering, uh, his own passion that'll happen in Jerusalem. But now what's interesting is that this, this same word also uh, is uh, used to describe the Christian life, uh, that we ourselves uh, suffer as Christ's people. Uh, and so this, this actually came up in the gospel reading on Sunday uh, that uh, Jesus told his disciples that because they belong, we belong to him, we also will suffer. Uh, I'll just give you one more example of this in the New Testament here. This is in Philippians. Uh, you can write this down if you want. This is in Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. Uh, and I mean, listen, listen to this. I mean, this is just beautiful. Um, Again, Philippians 1.29, again, Paul, this is Paul writing, same one who's writing to the Galatians. He says, For he, that is God, has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well, since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Uh, so Paul is saying that, just like Christ warned us what happened to us, Paul is saying that indeed uh, we suffer for Christ. And Paul says it's a privilege, not only a privilege to believe in Christ, but a privilege to suffer for him because it means that we have been conformed to Jesus. God has joined us so intimately to Christ that Christ's experiences become our own experiences. So that if Christ suffered, we also will suffer because we belong to him. But of course there's good news in this. <laughs> because just as Christ was raised and glorified, we also will be raised and glorified with him. Uh, and so our suffering actually becomes a, a, it becomes a comfort for us, a privilege, to say that we belong to Christ so intimately, so closely, that his suffering is also our suffering. And so now go back to the Galatians. And again, this third chapter, where in verse 4, Paul says, Did you experience so much for nothing? And again, not just experience, but did you suffer so much for nothing if it really was for nothing? Paul is saying, again, the, the question here is, how was it that the Holy Spirit came to you? Did the Holy Spirit come to you through, uh, through the preaching of the gospel and faith? 
Or did the Spirit come to you through your works, through circumcision, through keeping the law? Uh, and, and Paul is saying, just think about your own experience here, your, your own suffering. It was because you heard the gospel and believed it that you suffered. This is, this is what has made your life difficult. Um, and, and again, now normally as human beings, we would say, oh, how terrible that you've suffered. But as Christians, through faith, we can say it's a privilege to suffer because it means we've been joined to Jesus. And we know that suffering is not the, the last, does not get the last word, but that the last word is resurrection and eternal life. Uh, but Paul says now that uh, the, Holy, the Holy Spirit was, was given to you through faith. Your suffering has come on account of faith, the suffering which is a privilege because it means you've been joined to Christ. All of this has come through faith. And, and we can think about now the stories in the Gospels or the stories in the book of Acts uh, where this is so very concrete. I mean, we can think about our own lives as well. I mean, you know, all of us who are here gathered today, we can think about our own lives and the ways that our faith has uh, made life challenging, difficult. Uh, but again, the, these, these stories from Acts really tell the story about people who were uh, kicked out of their synagogue, uh, people whose families disowned them uh, because they believed in Jesus. And Paul is saying, look, Galatians, all of that happened, not because you were such good keepers of the law, not because you got circumcised. That wasn't what made life hard for you. Your Christian suffering has come because you believed in Jesus. That's what made, uh, that's what brought you this Christian suffering, that, which is such a privilege. Uh, this suffering, which is a privilege because you're joined to Christ, that came through your hearing the gospel and believing it. So Paul says, again, did you experience so much for nothing? Was all of that Christian suffering for nothing? Uh, all of that suffering that you experienced? But then, and now here's, here's that fatherly, loving tone. Paul says, if it really was for nothing, you know, or if it really was in vain, and Paul is sort of, sort of kind of enticing them, trying to talk sweetly to them here to say, look, people, it, 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 it doesn't have to be for nothing. It doesn't have to be for vain. Just ignore these, these ridiculous fake apostles who are trying to abuse you. Uh, all of your Christian experience and suffering does not have to be for nothing. Um, but, but you'll need to ignore these people who are trying to lead you astray and make you put all of your stock in your own works and your own intentions and your own decisions. Uh, Paul says, just forget about all that. And then it's not for nothing. Um, you know, in other words, Paul is saying, look, you, you, there's still hope for you. <laughs> um, we, we don't, I don't have to write you off yet, okay? Uh, there, there's that fatherly tone. You've, you've been foolish, but okay, you, you got, you know, it's, it, it's not, um, you're not without hope. Uh, Christ is still speaking to you. Uh, Christ is still uh, chasing after you, uh, forgiving you. Um, it does, this doesn't all have to be in vain. And then verse 5, Paul says, well then. Uh, does God supply you with the Spirit and work miracles among you by your doing the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? And so again, this becomes the question for Paul, is, is how it is that the Galatians received the Holy Spirit? Um, and again, did it happen uh, through the law uh, or through faith? Um, and, and again, this is where the, the book of Acts can be very helpful because we, we don't know a lot about these Galatians. Um, we don't know a lot about the, the miracles that happened among them. Uh, but we do see this uh, elsewhere in the New Testament uh, and how, uh, again, God worked miracles uh, wherever the message traveled. And we looked at this. I think it was just last week. We looked at those, those uh, words from Jesus at the end of Mark's gospel. Uh, where he says that Jesus says he is going to confirm uh, the preaching of the apostles through these miracles. And so the, the disciples would uh, drink deadly poisons and they would not be hurt. They would uh, be, you know, handle these poisonous snakes and not be hurt. Uh, fire would not burn them and so on. Uh, you know, there were these healings uh, and various miracles that were the disciples were, um, were uh, you know, were helping people and, and miraculously curing people. Uh, and, and Jesus says that all of this is going to be a visible demonstration um, of, of the, the truth of the word that is being spoken. 
Um, so we don't know particularly what kind of miracles the Galatians might have seen, although I think we would be wise actually to remember that this is the same letter, Galatians, uh, where Paul speaks about the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, and, you know, if you want to just peek at that quick, you can look. It's, it's Galatians 5, uh, verse 22. Uh, Galatians 5, 22, where Paul talks about the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, and, and, and fruits, remember, fruits are the visible thing that you can see on a tree that really show the tree is, is healthy and doing what it's supposed to do. Um, and, and the fruits uh, of the Spirit that Paul talks about, uh, that is the real evidence of the Spirit's work, we should notice in, in Galatians 5 verse 22 that, that Paul here isn't even really speaking about miracles that none of us has ever seen. I mean, he's not here, he's not talking about walking on water uh, or, uh, you know, raising the dead out of their graves or, you know, handling deadly snakes. I mean, here in Galatians 5.22, the fruits of the Spirit that Paul talks about are the things that we actually experience in our own lives, uh, in our own congregations as well. You know, so here he talks about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I mean, these are the works of the Holy Spirit, and we can assume that, that, that Paul had actually seen these things at work in the, in the Galatian congregation. Uh, these are things that we have experienced as well in our own church. Um, I mean, I know our, our Every church has its difficulties, its conflicts, you know, uh, you know we, we hurt each other and, and all of that. In churches, we all, that, all, that happens to all of us in every church. But in our churches, we also see the Holy Spirit at work, uh, people caring for each other, being patient with one another, believing against hope. I mean, when all, th all seems lost, continuing to trust God, you will get us through this. Um, this is the work of the Holy Spirit as well. Uh, and so in Galatians, in the third chapter, when Paul asks this question, verse 5, he says, again, does God supply you with the Spirit and work miracles among you by your doing the works of the law or by you believing what you've heard? And so Paul is saying, if nothing else, I mean, again, maybe, maybe people were handling poisonous snakes. I mean, that happened in the New Testament time. But at the very least, Paul is saying, look, I saw love among you. I saw patience among you. I saw you suffer for Christ and endure it with joy and patience because you trusted in Christ. Uh, Paul is saying, I saw all of this. Now, did all of this happen because you were such good, uh, well-behaved people? Did that all happen because you were circumcised? Because you learned the law of Moses and then applied it to your lives? No, Paul says. That happened because you heard the gospel and you received it with joy. You believed the gospel and that transformed your lives. You heard the gospel, you trusted it, and that flipped your worlds upside down. It was, it was that hearing of faith that transformed your lives like this. It was the gospel that brought you all this joy. It was the gospel that gave you reason to endure through your sufferings. And now, having received all of these gifts of the Holy Spirit, you want to trade that all in and say it wasn't enough? You want to say you think you're going to improve on that by now bringing Moses back into the picture and adding circumcision to this, as if the Spirit wasn't enough, as if faith wasn't enough. Again, he's saying, Galatians, you're being foolish. You had all these gifts uh, from God. And again, you're going to pretend like it wasn't enough. No, that, that's just foolishness. Um, uh, we could, why, why don't we actually? Let's, let's look at Acts 10. Uh, we've looked at this story before, uh, this, this story of Cornelius, um, this Gentile uh, who was brought into the family of God through faith, um, not through circumcision. Uh, we've, we've looked at this story before, but let's look at it one more time. Uh, indeed, it's wonderful to have these connections between our Galatians Bible study and the, the Bible study on Acts. Uh, go to Acts 10, uh, Cornelius and Peter. This is when Peter has that wild vision of all those animals being lowered to heaven <laughs> or lowered from heaven. 
and God tells Peter to eat these unclean animals. But look at the beginning of chapter 10, and I, I, I want to see us to, to notice some things here. Okay, so in the beginning of Acts 10, it says, In Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort, as it was called. He was a devout man who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. One afternoon at about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. He stared, stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? He answered, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. When the angel who spoke to him had left, he called two of his slaves and a devout soldier from the ranks of those who served him. And after telling them everything, he sent them to Joppa. Okay, you now this, this again is when, when Peter has this uh, amazing vision uh, of all of these animals. Uh, but I'm going to skip that, not that part now and, and go, uh, st skip ahead to verse, uh, verse 34. Uh, this is when uh, Acts 10, verse 34. This is when Peter finally arrives now, uh, and all of Cornelius' household is gathered, and Peter begins to preach. And Peter began to speak to them, I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Um, I'm going to skip uh, down to verse 39. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Peter has preached the gospel to Cornelius and all of Cornelius' family who are sitting there with him listening. And in verse 44, while Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. And Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and they invited him to stay for several days. So here are the things to notice about this. Uh, had Cornelius done any good works before his conversion, uh, you know, before uh, his baptism? Yes, he had. Uh, he was known at the beginning of this, at the beginning of this uh, uh, chapter. Uh, this is Luke writing these things, and Luke says, uh, this was a devout man. He feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously. He prayed constantly to God. Uh, and, and God certainly answered those prayers. But Luke is very careful about the way he describes this. <laughs> when was it that the Holy Spirit came upon Cornelius and everyone who was sitting there? Uh, was, it, was it one of those days when Cornelius walked in and to the temple and gave his alms? Uh, was it uh, one, of the, one of the days when um, you know, Cornelius uh, did something very kind uh, for some uh, poor person in Jerusalem? No. The Holy Spirit came upon Cornelius when Peter opened his mouth and started speaking. Uh, again, verse 44. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. Uh, and then Luke even makes this more clear for us, verse 45. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded, okay? Uh, uh, because uh, this, what does this mean? It means that there, there are really two groups of people in this room, the circumcised and the non-circumcised. Uh, the ones who are keeping the law of Moses and the ones who are not keeping the law of Moses. And where did the Holy Spirit fall? 
upon everyone who was listening to the word. Which means Cornelius, all those good things he had done, that's great. We, we all certainly want to encourage good works. Alms, giving, uh, you know, devotion to God, all of that, those good things we do, those are wonderful. But those were not the things that brought Cornelius the Holy Spirit. What brought him true righteousness from Christ was the word coming out of Peter's mouth. Again, let's hear that verse 43. <laughs> all the prophets testify about Christ that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And so just the way it worked for Cornelius and all of his family, yeah, yeah, we know Cornelius was a good guy. We're not so sure about all of Cornelius' family. I mean, they, there might have been some stinkers in that bunch. Uh, but all of them in that room, young and old, um, pious and impious, whoever they were, they heard this gospel. They believed it. Uh, the Holy Spirit came upon them, not because they, they didn't wait for circumcision. Uh, the Holy Spirit just came upon them because they'd heard this good news. And so again in Galatians, Paul says, uh, back to Galatians chapter 3, verse 5, Well then, does God supply you with the Spirit and work miracles among you by your doing the works of the law, circumcision and all the rest, or by your believing what you heard? And here I would also say, I think the King James is really good here uh, at the end of verse 5. Uh, I love this. The, the King James is really more literal about how the Greek says this. Uh, that is, at the very end, it's not uh, in the King James, it doesn't say believing what you heard, but it says uh, it comes by the hearing of faith. The hearing of faith. Uh, that is a very literal translation of what it says. Uh, the Holy Spirit has come to you by the hearing of faith. Uh, there, there is an emphasis here on, on our uh, ears <laughs> hearing the gospel, uh, the gospel uh, being preached to us. Believing what you heard, hearing of faith, neither one I think is, is bad. They're both good. But I, I think the King James is very literal here. It's the hearing of faith, uh, that gospel, that word that comes from our fellow Christians, leaps off of Christian, uh, out of Christian mouths and off of Christian tongues and lands in our ears. Uh, just like Cornelius and his household, everyone in that room heard Peter speaking the good news of Jesus and his forgiveness. And everyone received the Holy Spirit, that hearing of faith. Uh, and so again, Paul is saying that this is not your job to finish, Galatians. This is not your job to finish, uh, dear people of St. John's, all of us. Uh, this, this is the Holy Spirit who began it. It's the Holy Spirit who's going to bring it to completion. Uh, and so the works of Moses and the law are not part of the equation. And later on, Paul's going to come back to this and ask, so why do we have the law? Why did we ever get Moses? Why do we put the commandments in our catechism, for that matter? And Paul will come back to that. Uh, but right now he needs to make this very clear for all of us, uh, that the law has a purpose, <laughs> but, but its purpose is not to make you right before God. Uh, the purpose is not to justify you. The purpose is not to give you some way of getting the Holy Spirit or salvation. Um, that the law has a completely different purpose. But, but, but your, your salvation, the Holy Spirit, the one who has made you righteous uh, and, and given you all the benefits of Christ, uh, has come through the Word. And, and, ha and that happens when the Holy Spirit makes faith in our hearts so that we believe this Word. Uh, which really leads into verse 6, but I'm, I'm going to save that for next week. I'll, I'll just read it, just as Abraham, I mean, Paul, there's sort of a bridge here uh, from one thought to another, but just as Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Uh, so there Paul is looking back towards Genesis 15, 6. Uh, but uh, we'll go into that next time, I think, because um, that really kind of launches Paul in a whole other train of thought, where he's going to look now back at the Old Testament and how God has always accomplished this, this purpose of justifying us by faith. Uh, he did it in the Old Testament. He does it in the New Testament. He does it in the 21st century, justifies us by faith. So I'll pause right there um, uh, and uh, just ask uh, any, any questions, any comments? Um, is all of this making sense? Yes, Nancy, please. Can you unmute you or do I need to unmute you? There you go. Sure. All of it. So why are so many churches built on the flesh of feelings? Yeah. Um, I don't feel right. I don't yeah. want to be there. If I don't right. do this, um, it's not real. Yeah. 
Yeah. Isn't that kind of blasphemous? It is. And it's, it's, a, it's such a good question, Nancy. Uh, and, and again, like I was saying, uh, our, our human minds always want to sort of draw this division through our own selves. And say, and this, this, this is, uh, and say, there's a bad part of me, but there's still this really good part of me somewhere that could sort of help God out, or kind of finish the deal for God. Um, and so, yeah, in, in some churches there might be an emphasis on feelings, you know, to say it's my feelings that I can trust. And so, as long as I'm having good feelings, I must be having a true religious experience. Um, this is a very old idea, and I mean, you could sort of trace it all the way back to Greek philosophy. I mean, the Greeks certainly had this understanding that, that we sort of had a higher part and a lower part. There was the good part of me, and then there's the bad part of me, um, and somehow that salvation is sort of getting rid of the bad part, but holding on to and keeping and, and nurturing the good part of, of me, okay? Uh, now, like I said, you could sort of trace that back to Greek philosophy, but uh, you know, you don't have to. I mean, I think, again, this is just sort of a, a sinful impulse. Uh, all we, we always want to find some spark inside of ourselves that we can call good and take credit for. Um, and so there, there's something in me that I can take credit for. Maybe, it, maybe I'm 99% bad, but boy, that 1% sure is really good. And I can be proud of that 1%. And so again, you could call it your, your reason, your powers of, of thinking, you're so intelligent, and it's that intelligence which will really carry the day, uh, or it might be your feelings. And as long as I've got good feelings, positive feelings, excited, happy feelings, then I'm doing okay. Uh, and so, right, we, all, I mean, uh, we always want to put the, the division through ourselves, again, to say there's a bad part and there's a good part. Uh, but Paul is making this complete division to say, no, uh, there, there's God, and then there's flesh. <laughs> all of me is under the power of sin, but thanks be to God in Christ, all of me now has been redeemed uh, in righteousness. Uh, and, and Christ's forgiveness is total. Christ doesn't just cover up that 99% bad part, he covers the whole thing. God has, has taken me you know, top to bottom, inside and out, and made me his child. So basically, uh, the Bible churches, they're just cherry-picking the verses to yeah. support their mm -hmm. feelings. Yeah, right, right, right. They're not reading the whole thing. Yeah, right. And, and, uh, and that John, that third chapter of John, I think, is so good. And I, I'm glad we get to hear it on Sunday. Uh, because Jesus' point here is that, you know, human powers... Uh, can only create sin. Um, you know, what is born of the flesh is flesh. I mean, again, he, he's making this big division uh, so that it's not, again, it's not that like I got a good part and a bad part, uh, but all of me, top to bottom, even my best part can only create more sin. Um, and this is, oh, there, there's this really great verse. It's in Isaiah, oh, this is, uh, yeah, Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. Um, you know, this is a verse I should just remember, uh, and you can certainly, you know, write that reference in, in the margins of your Bible, Isaiah 64, verse 6. Isaiah says, uh, We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. I mean, boy, let that sink in. All our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. You know, Isaiah really gets it. Isaiah does not say, well, you've got a, there's a really good part of you somewhere inside, and, and I know you have some bad days, but boy, you sure do some good things sometimes. No, Isaiah says, and, and he is talking surely in, in mat, of matters of salvation here, uh, how it is that we stand before God in righteousness. And Isaiah says, you have nothing inside of yourself, whether it's your thoughts, your intentions, your feelings, nothing that you can hold up before God and ask him to somehow give you credit for, you know, to pat you on the back. Uh, Isaiah says, even our best deeds, the best things we have to offer, he says, before God, a filthy cloth. Uh, and, and so again, um, the way Paul is talking to the Galatians, there is flesh, <laughs> which includes all of me, the good and the bad, all of that is flesh. None of that is going to count before God. None of that is going to advance you towards the kingdom of heaven. Um, it is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, 
who comes through the word, through the preaching of Christ, uh, the Holy Spirit who began this work, who will bring it to completion. What do you think, Nancy? You like that verse, Isaiah? Good one, huh? Yeah. And, and, and again, I think it's, it's good to remember, we can sort of talk in different ways. That is, we can talk about the ways that our deeds count before God and before others. You know that, I mean, certainly we can look at people, even people who don't have any faith whatsoever, who reject Christ, who do good things, and we can say, yes, I am glad that there are kind uh, atheists in the world. I am glad that there are, you know, loving Buddhists, and there are, you know, um, you know, there are generous Muslims in the world. I mean, we can, we can look at people's deeds and simply evaluate them from a human perspective and say, yeah, I, I would rather have uh, somebody be kind than mean. I would rather have somebody be generous than stingy. I mean, we, we can do all that. But we have to, it's a different matter when we're talking about how we stand before God. You know, how God evaluates us, you know, when it comes to our, our eternal salvation. That's a different calculus. And there we have to say even our best deeds count for nothing and are even filthy, all right? Different, it's a different way of evaluating things, different perspective. Yeah, Denise. Just, ask, say, um, just kind of like with what Nancy said too, but I think there's churches too that have um, the music beforehand mm. because they want to usher in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And um, anyway... Yeah. Yeah, when, when Paul visited Cornelius, he didn't, he didn't bring his uh, CD player with him. You know, he, he brought the word. And, um, he brought the word. Yeah, and, and, uh, and, and yes, I think music can be used uh, in a manipulative way, you know, that we're just going to use music to sort of uh, get people in a certain emotional spot. Uh, and then we're just going to simply say, well, that's the spirit. I mean, as soon as you feel that tingly sensation of the emotions, that's the spirit. And that, and that can be very deceptive um, because the spirit does bring joy, peace, love. Um, uh, but that's, that's not simply emotions. Uh, those aren't simply feelings uh, and feelings that can be manipulated with the right, with the right music. Um, but, I, but like we were saying last week with art, I mean, art and music work in similar ways here where... Um, when, when art and music work with the word, then we've got something really powerful, you know, um, that's not just about an emotional ma manipulation, um, but is about God communicating to us um, through all these different ways, but, but with the word. I mean, just like if you take the word away from baptism, you've just got water. You know, you take the word away from communion, you just got bread and wine. Uh, but when the word is joined to the sacraments, these, these are powerful. Um, and, and, and art can be the same way. I mean, if, if the word is divorced from it, um, you might have some powerful things and, and some things which do generate an emotional response. Um, but that's not, you can't just simply assume that that's the same as, as faith. But with the word, I mean, when, when the word is spoken and, and when the word is sung, uh, when the word is spoken and, and even communicated in art, uh, yeah, you've got something really powerful. That, that shepherd that you saw reaching for the sheep in that painting, Denise. I mean, that's good right. stuff. I mean, all the stuff you guys brought. Um, yeah, the word <laughs> communicated visually and musically. Good. Good lesson. Good lesson. Yeah, good lesson. Well, last week we got through two verses. This week we got through three. So we're really we're moving in the right direction. We're really taking off. <laughs> now we're rolling. <laughs> Now we're cooking with gas. Um, I'd love to sing this uh, song with you again, um, one that we've sung, uh, let me see, in recent weeks, if I can find this. Um, so grab your hymnals, if you would. I want to, um, uh, 297. And I know you can't necessarily hear the recorder. 
I'm going to play it just to kind of get myself in the right key. So I, I apologize. You might just not hear anything for the next moment, but I want to put the melody back in my own ear, ear before we sing it. Okay, we'll sing the first three um, again. Hymn number two ninety seven. Uh, let's uh, let's sing the the first uh, the first three verses uh, today. And I'm going to turn on the mute here uh, before we sing. All right, great. Okay, salvation unto us has come by God's free grace and favor. Good works cannot avert our doom. They help and save us never. Faith looks to Jesus Christ alone, who did for all the world atone. He is our mediator. Theirs was a false misleading dream who thought God's law was given that sinners might themselves redeem and by their works gain heaven. The law is but a mirror bright to bring the inbred sin to light that lurks within our nature. And yet the law fulfilled must be, or we were lost forever. Therefore God sent his Son that he might us from death deliver. He all the law for us fulfilled, and thus his Father's anger stilled which over us impended. All right. Law, Moses, circumcision was not given for you to finish the job or help the spirit out. Uh, the law actually just simply exposes our sin, uh, which Paul will talk about in the weeks ahead in Galatians. So uh, that brings us to the end. Let us uh, conclude with our Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, friends. You have a good week. Yeah, I hope you all Bye, have a good weekend.